batteries are devices that are capable of storing electrical energy which can be used later to turn on an engine, generate sound or even power the processor of electronics devices. In a previous chapter we talked about how a capacitor works and, generally speaking, we could say that both a capacitor and a battery fulfill the same function, accumulating energy. However, there is a fundamental difference. The batteries work based on chemical reactions, that is, the atoms and molecules that make them up can be separated or joined when the battery is in use, generating a displacement of electrons and electric current that we can use. While in the case of capacitors, the atoms or molecules that compose it do not perform chemical reactions at any time. In fact, its operation is based on a fairly simple physical principle. Electric charges with opposite signs get attracted by each other, which allows these charges to accumulate when we put two conductors extremely close, but we prevent them from coming into contact. There are many types of batteries if we classify them according to the chemical elements that compose them and the reactions that occur within them, although in general terms we could separate them into two broad categories, primary or non-rechargeable batteries and secondary or rechargeable batteries. My idea was to make a video of each of these categories, but finally I preferred to focus this first video on how an electrochemical cell works, since this is the basis of operation of most batteries. And as you may have noticed we will need some knowledge of chemistry to survive. But don't panic, because we will start with the most basic element, this pair of frog legs. Over 200 years ago, in Luigi Galvani's laboratory a strange phenomenon was discovered in which, by simultaneously touching the nerves of a frog legs with a combination of metal electrodes such as copper and zinc, they moved as if they still had life. Based on this phenomenon, Galvani proposed that there was some kind of intrinsic electricity in animals. However, little time passed before Alessandro Volta, Another scientist of the time proposed a different approach. He believed that the electricity generated was a product of the materials used during the experiment. In the end, both were partly right, although the materials were fundamental. The electric current generated by the frog movement was indeed the result of chemical reactions caused by the composition of the frog's meat. Eventually Volta managed to reproduce the phenomenon without the need to use animal bodies, which was quite convenient. The voltaic pile, as it is known today, is composed of a series of stacked disks made of zinc and copper between which a separator is positioned, soaked in an electrolyte. The electrolyte was a substance that could conduct electricity, salt water being one of the most commonly used. The result of this mixture of components was a direct current source, just like in the batteries we use today but we still don't know how that current is generated. For this we will analyze the most basic form of a battery, a cell. In this case, a single cell was composed of a zinc disc, a separator with electrolyte and a copper disc to which we will add some wires and a lead to demonstrate its operation, and a switch to have a little more control. So far, so good, but having everything so close together eat a euro trademark is a bit complicated to visualize what are the chemical reactions that are happening, so we will take the elements that compose it, and we will transform them into what is known as galvanic cell or voltaic cell, in which, we will also add a few elements. Let's analyze again how this cell is composed. We have copper and zinc, but this time in the form of bars, each in a container, which will also be connected by a cable with the switch and the lead. And the last thing we would be missing is the electrolyte, which in this case will no longer be just one but three different ones which will allow us to have a more controlled reaction and easily visualize what is happening at a chemical level. Let's prepare the electrolytes one by one, since they are extremely important for what comes later. All of them correspond to a mixture of water and some salt which have the characteristic of dissociating into different ions that is, atoms or molecules with a defined electrical charge, either negative or positive. For the container with copper we will use copper sulfate which, when mixed with water, separates into copper atoms with a positive charge, plus 2, and a sulfate molecule with a negative charge, minus 2. For the zinc container we will use zinc sulfate, and the reaction will be practically the same as that of copper sulfate, only now we will have zinc atoms with a positive charge, plus 2. Finally, for the bridge which connects both containers which, by the way, has two plugs that make electrolyte mixing difficult, 
we will use common salt also known like sodium chloride which, when dissolved in water, generates chlorine ions with a negative charge, minus 1, and sodium ions with positive charge, plus 1. And surely now you a Euro trademark LL be wondering what exactly do those numbers mean? Well, since we're talking at an atomic level, we need to use the value of a known charge as a reference that has to make sense on such an absurdly small scale, and that charge is that of an electron, which, for those who want to know, corresponds to minus 1.602176565, etc. etc., multiplied by 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, so an unimaginably small value. Now that we have all the elements in order, let's see what happens when we close the circuit and we make the copper and zinc plates come into contact. The electrons begin to move from zinc to copper generating an electric current, but that is not the only thing that happens in the cell. In fact, several things are happening simultaneously. If we analyze only the container with the zinc plate, which is also known as half cell, somewhere, a zinc atom that had a neutral charge will lose two of its electrons and now it will have a positive charge, plus two, in other words, it will become in an ion which, like the others, will dissolve in the water. Therefore, the longer this process lasts, more solid zinc will dissolve in water. This process in which an element loses its electrons is known as oxidation. The element that is oxidizing will be known as the anode. On the other hand, if we go to the container with copper plate, somewhere one of the copper ions with charge plus two will receive the two electrons released by the zinc, it will become neutral copper, and it will stop being soluble in water. That is, it will take a solid form like the rest of the plate. Therefore, the longer this process occurs, more copper ions will take a solid form and will be deposited on the initial plate. This process in which an element gains electrons is known as reduction, and the element that is being reduced will be known as cathode. In this way, since there is a material that is being reduced and another that is oxidizing simultaneously, these reactions are known in abbreviated form as redox reaction. Although if we had only these two processes happening we would encounter a problem, and is that as its zinc is being oxidized and copper is reducing, an imbalance of the charges begins to be generated in the containers. The zinc sulfate electrolyte will be increasingly positive, and the copper sulfate electrolyte will be increasingly negative, which would begin to stop the displacement of electrons through the cable, as at some point, the positive charge on the zinc sulfate electrolyte will be large enough to overcome the ability to attract electrons that copper had. This is where the salt bridge comes in. The chlorine and sodium ions are able to move to each container to rebalance the charges. In other words, the negatively charged chlorine ions will move to the container with zinc where there were more positive charges and the positively charged sodium ions will move to the container with copper where there were more negative charges, keeping balance and allowing electrons keep flowing in a controlled way. Although there is a detail we haven't talked about. Why do electrons move from zinc to copper first? What happens is that each half cell has what is known as standard electrode potential or standard reduction potential which you can find in huge tables like this, which were obtained experimentally under standard conditions. That is, at 25 degrees Celsius, an atmosphere of pressure and concentrations of 1 mole per liter, among other things, using hydrogen reduction as a reference point. If we look for the reactions corresponding to our half cells we are going to find that the highest standard reduction potential is that of copper and therefore electrons will flow in that direction, but that's not all. Since we know the standard reduction potential of the two half cells, we can calculate the theoretical voltage that the whole cell would give us. Of course, provided they meet standard conditions which does not usually happen, but at least we have a benchmark. Basically, no matter the materials used in the redox reaction, most batteries work in a similar way. We could mix half cells composed of different elements and get different voltages as a result. But even though that allows us to have a lot of different voltages, the number of possible combinations of cells is a finite number and unfortunately most of them do not exceed 3 volts per cell. The good news is that it doesn't stop us from getting higher voltages because when connecting several cells in series and following the same polarity the voltages are added. In fact, this is precisely how 9-volt batteries work. Inside of them we will find 6 cells connected in series each of approximately 1.5 volts. 
Now that you know how an electrochemical cell works, the next thing is to know how the different types of batteries are composed and what makes some of them be better than others. But we will see that in the next video. Remember to subscribe and click the notification bell so you don't miss the next videos.